As Simon says, I'm going to be talking about the cost-sharing exemption guidance and a quick uh, whistle-stop tour through what has happened with uh, VAT and the higher education sector. Um, but actually, before we do that, it, um, most of what I'm going to talk about is, is about shared services. And actually, it's, it's important to, to remember that the higher education sector has got a long and glorious history of uh, participating in shared services. Um, one of the uh, times that I gave a presentation on the history of shared services in higher education, I was on a panel again with Chris Cobb from the University of London, and he took great delight in correcting me about the length of time that there have been shared services in, in the higher education sector. And the University of London's got a long and glorious career uh, of shared services going right back to the early Victorian age. So they now have pride of place in whatever I talk about in terms <laughs> of, of shared services. Um, there was a bit of a bidding war between him and Malcolm Gillies, I remember, on the day. But uh, I, think, I think Chris won. Um, but also, um, ever since in, in the modern age, um, we've had uh, uh, other shared services which have been developed for the sector, UCAS and, and UCA in the 60s, the Purchasing Consortia in the, in the 70s, JISC and, and HESA in more la latterly. Um, so, so actually, we've got a lot to be proud of in the sector, and, and all of this is an evolution uh, of what we are doing, dealing with today. So, for example, um, we have developed in the last few years very successful shared services, one of which is the, the head higher education degree data check run, out, run through graduate prospects. I've only got 10 minutes, so I'm not going to describe all of these to you, just to tell you that they're there. But if, if potential employers want to check somebody's award, they can actually go on to this, this uh, service and pay a small fee and do that check. Um, and that prevents data fraud. And uh, institutions such as University of Manchester and Imperial College both use that service. And there are a dozen others, and it's growing rapidly. Um, but also others, there's HE Shared Legal, um, which uh, is run out of the University of Strathclyde at the moment um, and reduces some vast legal fees that, um, that some institutions uh, have, um, have seen in, in past few years. Norman out of Al's helpline out of Northumbria and the British University's Film and Video Council, which actually has got 40-odd institutions who use their services and save a fortune in... Uh, uh, in saving and, um, and making available broadcast content, BUFTC does it for the sector and does it very, very effectively. But also, we've got to remember that shared services is not just about uh, the sector. There are also some commercial providers who very effectively offer what is in effect shared services for the sector and the one that I cite here, WPM Payments Gateway. Last time I uh, talked about WPM, I said that they had 40 institutional customers. And, uh, but, but actually I looked on their website yesterday and to count up how many customers they'd had in the higher education and further education sector. And I gave up. It's well, uh, my estimate is it is well over 100. So a really successful commercial provider offering services into the sector. Oops. To your way of making it interesting. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> Just testing me to see that I can actually use the technology. Um, but, also, but also there are other, um, there are other uh, shared services which are developing. Uh, the N8 group are looking at asset sharing and, and looking at, indeed, using the cost sharing uh, group exemption for that. Realising opportunities up in the northeast has been talking to me about what they're doing. And jobs.ac.uk in Warwick has been looking at ways of developing their service, putting CVs online and things like that, and making the application process far easier. Um, so there is more to do, and, 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 uh, and there are numerous other examples that we could talk about. Um, but actually, in the past few years that I've been dealing with shared services, there are a number of barriers that have been put up um, by HEIs, on behalf of HEIs, by others, uh, where they suggest that actually um, collaboration and shared services is far more difficult than, uh, than uh, and therefore, actually, is something that uh, institutions uh, 
shouldn't concentrate on. Um, I have found in the past, over the past few years, that the collaboration by institutions at an institutional level is actually quite difficult to achieve um, for, for various reasons and, and, and therefore what we've done is we have actually introduced shared services which are on offer to institutions rather than encouraging institutions to create them for themselves and they actually are taken up far more successfully and some of the ones that I've talked about are, are that sort of example. And also the cost of change. Is, is something which is seen as a barrier. If, if you aren't going to get the payback for a number of years, why do it? Why not uh, concentrate on something else and use your resources in that way? And as we all know, there are huge um, challenges in the sector and therefore institutions have different priorities and maybe, just maybe, shared services, use of the cost sharing group exemption is not really top of the list and I can understand why. But the major barrier that has been put to um, ministers about higher education and why there aren't more shared services being developed to deliver efficiencies in the higher education sector is the VAT one. You can see I've put it fourth on the list and actually it probably is where it sits, but that's the one that gets the most focus. So just a quick run through, this is my um, VAT 101 talk for you about why VAT is a problem in higher education. Education is an exempt activity, it's VAT exempt uh, for VAT purposes. And also closely related activities are exempt, publicly funded um, education this is. Uh, also closely related activities are exempt. So residences fees and things like that are also exempt. So there's a huge amount of business that higher education institutions undertake which uh, are not chargeable to VAT. But what that actually means is that the input tax that, um, that VAT, uh, that uh, institutions uh, incur cannot be reclaimed against the, the, the output tax. And therefore there is a, uh, an issue for institutions who, if they were to create a shared services which is, which is outside of their institution, therefore charging into their institution, putting more VAT burden on the institution, there's nothing that the institution can actually reclaim that VAT against. That's the end of that one. If you don't understand it, see me later. Um, so there is an answer to this, um, and it is the cost-sharing exemption, which is actually in, in um, EU law at present, is used by some member states, but actually had not been enacted by uh, the UK government until 2012, when the present government decided that it would act, it would enable the cost-sharing exemption. Um, and so since 2012, we've been enabled to do it. And in August 2012, HMRC created some guidance about the use of the cost-sharing exemption. But that guidance actually asked more questions than it answered. And for, for HE in particular, there were a fair number of questions. Uh, it talks about exact reimbursement of costs. What does that actually mean for, for institutions? Um, it talks about not directly marketing the services. Well, actually, is a cost-sharing group who wants to get out to the higher education sector, is that actually marketing or is that just information about um, the services that are on offer? Um, and actually, there are existing um, uh, organisations and collaborations that could transform themselves into a cost-sharing group. How do they do that? Uh, the uh, Purchasing Consortium, I'm part of the purchasing world, so uh, procurement consortia spring to mind readily and there is at least one who's looking at um, doing exactly that. Um, are different classes of membership allowed? Can one institution offer out services and, and be a super user of those services and get other institutions to participate? The way the, the sector works is that um, often there are a few <coughs> enthusiastic um, institutions who create something and then later on other institutions come through and, and see that it's a good thing, I want to be part of that. Well, how does that work? We then have different classes of membership, but actually some institutions who've put more investment in than others. How can those institutions recover their costs? Um, uh, there are certainly procurement rules around um, cost-sharing groups. Um, they are little understood. The guidance that we're going to create gives some guidance as to how you can participate in a cost-sharing group without going through lengthy procurement uh, um, tendering exercises. 
And importantly, and JISC is going through this at the moment, what happens when a cost-sharing group receives some grant funding? Because then the direct reimbursement of costs uh, rule is, is broken immediately. But, uh, and they have had uh, lengthy discussions with Revenue and Customs about what that actually means. And what that has actually mean is educating Revenue and Customs about the way the higher education sector works. So we've produced some guidance. Um, it's in a fairly uh, complete form at the moment. It's actually something which Hefke is, uh, is embarking on in a new way. This guidance is very lengthy, uh, but also it is something which we don't envisage anybody ever printing out. The guidance is a walkthrough, and you can actually, as you can see, there's lots of links on this page, and you can determine where you are in a process uh, and what you want to understand, and you can uh, hit the links and go to different pages within the guidance. And there's lots of links back through, so it, it walks you through, trying to give you the information in the form that you want to see it, rather than have to read from page one through to, through to the end. So uh, there's another walkthrough. It's a decision tree. Um, of, uh, to, to allow people to make decisions about whether uh, a cost-sharing group is appropriate. And sometimes, actually, cost-sharing groups um, are not appropriate. And that, um, that uh, organisation up in the northeast, uh, because they were so closely aligned to, um, to, to education, we actually decided in the end that it wasn't appropriate for them and they didn't need to become a cost-sharing group. They didn't actually need to charge any VAT because of the, uh, the services they were, they were offering. Um, and, and then there's, there's simple things like checklists on, um, on um, service level agreements and, um, and, and membership agreements and those sorts of things, maintaining a CSG. There's, there's lots of that sort of guidance and some case studies walking through people through what... Uh, what the guidance actually means and some models about, uh, about uh, cost-sharing groups. Um, so, published this month, fingers crossed. Um, it's going through the Hefke processes at the moment. Um, there will be some case studies to follow which are being worked on. So, in the next couple of months, probably early autumn, we will have some, some case studies. And the document, and I call it a document, it's an online document, is something which will be dynamic we are getting six monthly updates from, from KPMG who have worked with us to produce it. Um, and so whenever, and, and actually they've said if there's something important to do, it's, it's not that there's going to be four, six, six monthly updates. Actually, if there's something important to change, they will change it for us because they do want the document to be a meaningful uh, and usable uh, piece of guidance for the sector. <coughs> 